Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Catherine Nagel, and I will be speaking about, well, the technical title here is From Performance to Poetry, The Power of Suzanne Schoenharjo's Narrative. Um, as Kevin Gover mentioned earlier this morning, narrative is an overly used word, but here the idea is, is, is showing Suzanne's work as an artist, which I thought was I was very excited, was exclusively my topic, and yet I've watched every single person who gets up here talk about her poetry and her work as an artist, which really, yeah, I know, I, I have a slide on Mateo Romero's dress, too, um, and the poem that inspired it. Um, but, you know, so as I watched that dress go by five times this morning, I thought, well, I think what this really speaks to is just the profound impact that her work as an artist has had, which I, I think oftentimes in, in our in Indian country, um, we speak about the political works because you can just see like the list of statutes that we saw earlier, right? And we can talk about Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, this statute, that statute, that law. And those are critically Im Im important works that she has brought forward and, and, um, and worked on her entire life. At the same time, her work as an artist has fed that, has inspired that, and has obviously touched us in a profound way, um, such that no one seems to be able to recount the political achievements without discussing her work as an artist. So with that foundation, let's just dig in a little bit deeper, and yes, we will eventually get to the dress. But um, do I hit is the over button? Aha, yes, okay. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about her work in performance. Um, and, and just to be clear, you know, uh, I have 20 minutes or slightly less, and um, you know, I thought about this presentation and it's like, okay, I could I could spend maybe 20 seconds if I if I want to if I want to cover every actually if I wanted to cover everything in terms of every play she's written, every poem she's written, I would have maybe about five seconds on each. So I decided to pick the ones that I think exhibit um, some of the most important qualities of of her entire life's work. And one of my favorite things that uh, my, my research led to was the Average Savage Review, um, which was an incredible troupe of performers, uh, you know, guided and led by Suzanne Schoen Harjo. Um, the, the quote, the Average Savage Review was a traveling troupe of NCAI staff, associated attorneys, and friends of Indian country who handled the stress and frustration of the Reagan years with song, dance, and a whole lot of laughter. Um, this is actually a, uh, and I, I actually heard that Duke, you're featured here on the, on the what would be the far left side of the photo, um, um, kind of up in the left hand corner back there. Is that is that true? Is that you? Oh, oh, okay. I, I may have I may have been misinformed. Well, I thought that was Duke way back there, but in any event, he apparently frequently uh, appeared at these performances, and maybe even helped with the, at the DJ stand. Oh, okay. He doesn't want to take credit. Okay. Oh, that. Okay. But um, I think you can see here, there, there's a lot of humor infused in this, right? And I think, you know, how interesting to start off the day with Suzanne's clip on Oprah, where she is in a very clear and articulate way deconstructing um, the harmful way in which the mainstream culture has labeled us and dehumanized us, right? And, and then you see the way she's making fun of it and laughing at it. And I think anyone who's worked anywhere um, in performance knows how powerful laughter is. And I've seen it, you know, as, a, as my work, at, you know, as a playwright in the theater, you can take anyone who is opposed to an idea or a viewpoint and you make them laugh and it opens up their mind in a way that no legal brief, no statute, no argument before Congress, no, nothing else really is going to do. So, you know, in terms of all of the work um, that she's led, I think this is one of the most brilliant. Um, and, and this is just a little bit more about the average review, but um, she uh, <laughs> said, quote, it was a break for us. It's very hard work doing the NCI work. It was sort of a staff retreat kind of thing. Um, and they were written up in the uh, Albuquerque Journal, called them a talented group of Indian satirists. Um, and this is, I found one of their, um, some of my, this is, uh, you can, <laughs> <laughs> the, the amazing graphics behind this. No, it really, it really is incredible. So this is the song book that they used. And I'm, I'm about to call someone out because you may not have realized this. This was a breeding ground for individuals to someday lead this museum. In fact, this is where Kevin Gover, like, you know, really learned the ropes. And in fact, 
you'll see down here at the bottom, uh, he's listed as one of the, of the average savage, savages. And, uh, I, you know, I, again, because we don't have, I mean, I think we could all sit here and, and sing these songs, and that would actually be the best way we could spend 20 minutes. But um, here are a few of the titles on the dole again. Uh, don't call him Ross the Knife. Um, I found my thrill on Capitol Hill. The NCAI Shuffle. Uh, the Gambler, B-I-N-G-O. Um, actually, this one I thought was, was, was pretty clever. Um, there was a tribe that had a name, and bingo was its name. Oh, and I won't sing the whole thing because I, I'm not a singer for many reasons. But uh, it's really, really kind of intelligent when you think of what's happening at the time that the Average Savage Review came out and, and the political commentary that is infused in, in something that actually is so enjoyable. Right, so incredibly enjoyable and so intelligent and so smart. Um, this is one more song called um, Capitol Hill. And um, so uh, anyone who actually would like access to this, I know this is in the NMAI archives. And so I'm sure Kevin Gover would also love to explain all the songs that he co-wrote. Um, <laughs> Is he not in the audience right now? I was going to totally pull him out. Um, but, but to really, to, to show how serious this is, right, um, Senator Inouye actually said, quote, uh, who, he actually witnesses one of the performances, and he later wrote to NCI that the performance was, quote, I saw the performance of the Average Savage Review was not only entertaining but politically informative. I shall be mindful of its commentaries and sensitive to the charges that were so sweetly sung to me. I shall stand with you and be an advocate of your positions in the Congress. Right? So, I mean, here we have this amazing woman who is galvanizing the politics of the time and working, you know, on the Hill, in the White House, and all these different political bodies, but at the same time, getting folks together for something that is so satirical and hilarious, but ends up impacting, right, the messages on the Hill and the laws that come. And he was one of our biggest allies at the time, right? And this was how he received that message. So I just, going back to the power of performance when, um, when combined with politics, which was no accident on Suzanne's part, right? She understood that, um, that to get this message across, you had to use performance, you had to use art, because, you know, when you've been silenced in so many ways, you can't just stand back and expect someone to, to read, you know, your brief that you file in a court or some other sort of legal mechanism. You have to reach people through other means. And as an artist, she, um, she did that in some very profound ways. I think another thing that I, I would like to focus on is her, her impact on Native theater, which um, may also be one of, I mean, there are so many things to talk about when you talk about Suzanne Harjo that I think it's, it's easy to get caught on like the first 10 that you think of and not get to you know the next five or 50 that come after that. But her, her influence in the native theater is not to be um, lost or discounted. And specifically because of the time period in which she was working on native theater in the 60s and the 70s and the folks that she was working with. And I think people today may not realize, but uh, just it, it hasn't been until very recently that mainstream American theaters have started to actually produce Native playwrights. This, this work didn't just happen overnight. It really, um, and we've always been telling our own stories, right? We've always been storytellers. But um, in the 60s and the 70s, there was a real movement to, to get Native voices not just onto our own stages and our own communities, but onto the American stage. And, and Suzanne worked very closely with Spider Woman Theater, which is an amazing group of Native women who actually just recently were written up in the New York Times. So um, Google Spider Woman Theater and New York Times, and you can read all about Muriel Miguel and, and um, the other amazing folks who worked with her. But together, they all, um, they did numerous programs, plays, radio plays. They did shows at the public. They hosted an entire Native, and, and this was actually more recent. This was in the last, within the last 10 years. Um, Suzanne came back to the public theater and, and organized a Native, they hosted a Native theater festival there and had a series of lectures that took place. Now, why is this important? Because just like film and television and other forms of entertainment, you know, Theater is another way in which non-Natives learn about Natives. But when most plays that are getting performed are, or, or the majority of theaters in the United States have never produced a, a single Native playwright, then what do folks learn of us, right? They learn to tolerate things like the Washington football team because that's all they've ever seen. And, um, and actually, I have to acknowledge Phil Deloria, who I, it's just such an honor to actually meet you for the first time in my life. Um, I, his book, Playing Indian, is, I think, one of the 
the, the, the most important books to read out there to understand why it's so harmful that we've been excluded from the American theater um, and how the harmful performances of us on the football field, but also in the American theater, actually how that impacts not just our own psyche, but the harmful legal framework that surrounds our entire lives, which is everything that Suzanne was working to dismantle, right? But again, she wasn't just working to change the law. She knew that she had to stop folks from playing Indian. Right, And part of that was also showing them, don't just play Indian, but step aside and let us tell our own stories. Right, So she was doing this decades before American theaters finally said, yes, we will, we will let you do that. And these are just a few photos of her and some of the Spider Woman Theater and some more recent photos of them as well. That's Muriel McGuell on the bottom right here, standing next to Suzanne and her, her daughter um, to her left. And uh, Suzanne is quoted as saying, I'd never been able to write a script, coach them in the ways that my son says, um, Indian modern, had it not been for my theater and its arts training here in New York and the grittiness of New York. So just really underscoring the importance of that time period and thinking about what has continued on since then and Suzanne's work as an activist. And I want to just touch a moment for um, on, on um, uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson because, um, you know, in terms of what Americans are most likely to see. This play did go to Broadway. It was produced at the Public Theater. So here we had a bunch of Native folks, including Suzanne and other Native artists, who were working with the Public Theater to bring in Native artists. And then they turn around and they produce a musical called Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, which advertises him as, as a sexy rock star, um, literally in like skinny jeans, like, you know, on the poster like this. And there's some very, first of all, there's red face in the play. They, don't, they didn't hire any Native writers to contribute to the script. Um, they didn't hire any native actors. They put non-natives on stage with red face paint and fake feathers. And they had them come out and do a really stupid dance number where they sang um, the lyrics here on the right. Ten little Indians standing in line. One got executed, then there were nine. Nine little Indians haven't long to wait. You know, um, it's pretty horrific, right? The... Uh, most of the American theater community didn't seem to have a problem with this. And this, by the way, you know, shows that go to Broadway then end up getting performed in colleges and in high schools. So again, this is an education to non-natives that it is okay to dehumanize native people, which is exactly what Suzanne spoke out against. Um, but I just, I just want to point this out because not only is she creating her own art, but she's also holding accountable those some of the most powerful art institutions in the United States that are doing the most to dehumanize us. And for most theater artists, calling out the public in this way is something they would never consider because it's the theater that created Hamilton, it, right? Everyone loves Hamilton. If you're a theater artist, this is where you dream of being someday, right? So you, you wouldn't dare criticize them, even though they may be dehumanizing your people, because you don't want to jeopardize your own career. Of course, that didn't stop Suzanne for a second. Um, and she was very public in terms of her critique. And I just want to read to you, um, I think, some her writing on what she had to say about this horrible musical. She said, quote, my critique of bloody, bloody Andrew Jackson is more than a matter of Western morality concerning right and wrong. For native peoples today, it's about life and death. The dehumanizing, objectifying portrayal of native people in bloody, bloody, as well as in other contemporary performances of red face, perpetuate the 19th century American story that native people are less than human. The lessons of bloody, bloody are seen in American society today. Today, native women are murdered at a rate higher than any other race in America. The majority of the perpetrators of violent crimes against native women are non-native men. The jokes in bloody, bloody about killing Indians are not jokes, they are a reality. This is so important. One, she's talking, I mean, this finally, I think America is waking up and having this conversation now in 2019 and 2018 about MMIW and the crisis of, of violent crimes against Native women. Um, she's making this powerful connection. It's no surprise we have the highest rates of violence today, right? Where does that come from? It comes from a culture that says it's okay to dehumanize us, that gives permission to commit this violence against our people. And she's calling it out directly here. But if you'll pay attention to when she wrote this article in 2015, at that point, mainstream American theaters were not producing Native playwrights. And in the four years since then, we've seen the first Native plays at major theaters here in Washington, D.C., in theaters in Oregon, in theaters across the country. I just, I think that to me that's not an accident. 
Um, I also just want to highlight her work as a playwright, and we've been very fortunate to get to work together. Um, in that same article where, so, you know, the other thing about Suzanne is, is she will always deconstruct and critique the dehumanizing methods that institutions of culture use in the United States to dehumanize us. At the same time, she'll always explain, and there's an easy solution, right? Just promote Native artists, promote the work of Native artists. And in, her, in this article, she said, quote, if American theaters were to, pr were to produce plays that substitute authentic Native voices for red face, Native people wouldn't have to fight for years to repatriate the remains of their loved ones that have been purchased by non-Natives. And so at the same time that she, she's explaining how this dehumanization of us in the theater perpetuates a legal framework that dehumanizes us. And um, the play that actually she and I were able to write together, uh, which we toured around to different universities and museums, um, even did in Oklahoma City one time, is called My Father's Bones. And it actually recounts the story of the Sack and Fox Nation and, and their fight to, and, and actually um, Jim Thorpe's sons, his children's fight to bring him home. You know, his, it's a, actually a very tragic story of how his non-native ex-wife stole his body in the middle of the burial ceremony and sold it to a town in Pennsylvania. And um, the tribe brought a lawsuit, and Su Suzanne worked directly on this, right? So she was working, uh, of course, always behind the scenes and not always taking credit for her work, but to help draft many of the briefs that were filed in the federal courts in this action. And of course, the action was under NAGPRA, a statute that she helped draft. And at the same time, working on a play that explains the human side of the story and opens hearts and minds to what's really, really happening here. And unfortunately, um, they lost the case to bring Jim Thorpe home in the Third Circuit, but, um, but this play carries on, and I think um, it is through storytelling that we can continue to tell these stories and hopefully someday see some sort of legal, legal action, whether it's in the federal courts or in Congress, to allow Jim Thorpe's nation and his family to bring him home. Um, okay, running out of time, got to keep going. Okay, poetry. <laughs> Um, so I just, I, I want to talk about Suzanne, um, for a moment as a poet, because she is. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from her about poetry, she said, quote, poetry appeals to me because it can have the grace of water and the focus of rock, even in the same piece, and it accommodates both facts and color in the same space. She has also said, I began writing poetry because of the poetics and density of Cheyenne and Muscogee oral history as related by my Cheyenne and Muscogee relatives. There is an orderliness, consistency, and elegance that sounds to me the way poetry is structured on the page. There also is a deliberate use of silence for emphasis that not only lends itself to poetic form, but is poetic form. She is masterful as a poet, and I just, um, because I only have two minutes left. I won't read to you the entirety of this poem, but let's look at it for at least a little bit of the time that I have left. Uh, this is the poem that inspired the dress that has been so talked about today, by uh, the dress created by Matteo Romero. And this was in an exhibit called Blood of the Sun and uh, curated by um, America Meredith, who I think is here today. Um, yes, so it's a, it's a powerful, powerful poem, right? And and it's powerful too when you understand its origins. Um, and, and, and several folks have talked about this as well. Um, I'll just read to you another one of the quotes. Suzanne, in speaking about where this poem came from, said, quote, that's several lifetimes from when my mother and I first visited the museum in New York. Um, and it says Harjo, and her journey of many years of labors and magic to achieve those goals began on her mother's birthday in 1965, a month after Harjo turned 20 and four days after her first child was born. They were horrified to see that the museum was a, quote, a place of profanity and sacrilege. And so, um, you know, upon leaving the, mu the museum, she decided, okay, something must be done about this. And so, um, I, others have spoken about the poem, and this is, you know, the, the dress, but this was, this dress, which is, is so powerful, comes from, and is inspired by her poem, was a part of a, a, a much larger exhibit featuring a lot of really talented Native artists who responded to many of her poems, right? And so, um, one of those artists is Kenneth Johnson, who is Creek, Muskogee Creek. And um, Suzanne's quote, um, working with this exhibit, she said, quote, it's an honor to be associated with such extraordinary artists. Many of these artists have inspired my creative and policy work for years. I look forward to the interpretations and, of, and commentary on my poetry by these diplomats, resistors, and catalysts in the arts. And uh, just to, and, uh, to wrap up really quickly here, I just want to show some of the other artists um, who participated in Blood of the Sun. 
And to just underscore that, you know, Su I think Suzanne has been a giant in the field of, of activism around legal and policy change. But I, th I think, and I think by, it's, not, it's no accident, right? It's by design that she's approached that work also as an artist and has been successful because of the profound way in which she views art and the connections between art and art as an assess, you know, a, 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 um, a tool and a vehicle that is necessary in driving all of this change. Okay, I'm beyond time and I'm really quick here. Um, this is what uh, Kenneth Johnson created that was also part of the Blood of the Sun exhibit. This is Suzanne's poem, Follow Me to the Mountainside, um, which was what Anita Fields used to create her work. Um, and you can see both that, and this was all um, a part of that. So, all right, I think I am finished. So thank you so very much.